it would be a lot easier to deal with the regime now in a mm -hmm. targeted fashion. And right? I'm not saying we go to war with Iran, although if anybody thinks that that war would, you know, I mean, it would be messy for a while. But, you know, we've got the ability. Right. And, our, and, and look, the, are the Saudis going to get upset about it? Absolutely not. Right. Right. Are they going to come out publicly and go, yeah, yeah, no. But a, a, a number of countries in that region ha would have no problems with Iran, the regime, again, getting punched in the nose and told, you know, in, in no uncertain fashion, this has got to stop. You have got to stop this. This, is, this does nothing for the community of nations. And, you know, but again, I don't think that's going to happen. And nobody wants that to happen. But I don't see any other resolution to this. Joining me today is a former CIA officer, a security expert, and host of the President's Daily Brief podcast, Mike Baker. Finally, hey. welcome to the Rubin Report. Thank you very much, Dave. Appreciate I, it. I'm glad to have you for a couple of reasons. I see you on Rogan. I see you on Gutfeld, all, all the usual places. The podcast is great. Uh, but you're kind of doing me a favor by being here today, too, because I've been doing a lot of racehorse politics, oh. a lot of primary, <laughs> oh, God. who's going to win, battle it yeah. out, all of that stuff. And I'm actually really looking forward to taking a little bit of a break from that and talking yeah. mostly about war. Yeah. Does oh, that, oh does, good. Does that sound, uh, we'll lighten it up a little bit. The several impending wars that <laughs> that's are right. that's right. <laughs> that the are world's coming. on fire. So let's uh, cheer people up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you tell people just briefly before we dive into all that? Because sure. I, I normally don't even keep notes in front of me, but I was like, there's a lot of places on this planet that are aflame right now, and I want to make sure we don't miss any of them. Yeah, it's but, exactly right. But before we get to any of that, can you just give people a little more of your background for someone that that may not know who you are, and then we'll and then we'll dive in. Sure. Um, yeah. I, you know, I. I just, was with the agency, the CIA, for uh, about 20 years, going on 20 years. And I was in what they call the Directorate of Operations. So the agency is broken up into different segments, right? You have operations, you have the Directorate of Intelligence. They change the names occasionally, but basically it's always the same four groups. And the Intel Director, that's where all the smart people are, and they write the reports. They take all the intelligence. They take everything that's coming in, right? And you have the really smart writers, the analysts, all those people. And then they have a uh, a, a, an admin, essentially, section that does all the logistics, and they really keep the place running. Because uh, it's it's not like just admin for, say, a company that's making widgets, right? <laughs> you're you're running Intel operations around the world, mm -hmm. so it's a it's a bit of a different game. And then there's the science and technology group, and they make all the amazing gadgets, right? So think about, um, well. I can I disappeared on a rabbit hole on that one. <laughs> Battery tech. Are, are you wearing any of those things? I, I, at the I, I, I am. I as a matter of fact, I never travel without a couple of gadgets. Yeah, right. uh, but they, uh, you know, everything from spy satellites to the U two program. Uh, battery technology. If anybody's walking around with a defibrillator, right, it, they can thank the agency because they they led the way in terms of miniaturization, right? Because mm -hmm. you needed small batteries for operational reasons, right? Uh, but I was in the director of operations and spent all my time overseas, which was great. Um, had a wonderful time, got out, started a, a private sector company that does um, uh, basically intelligence and security risk mitigation. And it's Portman Square Group. And we're now- I take it that's probably going pretty well these days. It's gone well, the yeah. things happening in the world. I think, you know, it sounds mercenary, but we do well when there's a little bit of chaos. Um, and we- most of our work is, is, is overseas. You know, we do, we do a fair amount in the States, but the majority is overseas. And we've got offices of, uh, in a number of places, uh, great people. It's been a wonderful experience because I had no business experience at all, none. And so when it came time to get out of the agency, because I was raising my daughter, um, I had to do something, right? And I didn't really have a lot of skills. So I thought, well, I'll stay in what I know. And it worked out. I started it with a, a, a wonderful friend of mine who came from the British teams. And uh, we just got really lucky. And we met wonderful people. And we, best thing we did was we hired smart people, right? And then we gave them the, the objective and then we set them on their way, right? And that was, that's, uh, uh, there's a, a few things I learned from the agency. And one of them was, was essentially that, right? Bring on the best people you can. Tell them what the mission is, and then have the confidence that they're going to get on with it. Right? And now, if things go south, okay, then you got to step in and, and help out. But so we've been fortunate; we've done that. And then I, I got involved in some some TV work and, and some film work. Um, the podcast has been great. We mm -hmm. just started that in September. The President's Daily Brief. 
whole new experience. I give you a, a tremendous amount of credit because it's it's not easy. Right? It's a lot of gadgets, mostly hairspray. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the key. Well, I've gone through an awful lot of glitter yeah. and lip balm. Yeah. Uh, but no, it's it's uh, it's an audio podcast right now. They they're turning it into a into a video podcast. Uh, but it's it's a lot of work. So I you know I take my hat off to you, but uh, it's been fun. So let me ask you a little bit more about uh, the agencies in general, because I've mm. talked to a couple of CIA guys, obviously FBI, et cetera. And I always find it interesting when you when you talk to some of these guys who are out in terms of how much they can talk about and mm. how they can take the stuff that they learned and apply it to either new businesses or just kind of what's going on in the world without without breaking protocol, without right. revealing secrets, et cetera. How do you how do you balance all that stuff? Well, you know what? Um, you have to be smart enough to know what you're not supposed to say, <laughs> right? And then you have to be disciplined enough not to to open your yap and 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 do that. And so sources and methods you never talk about. I've got a very good relationship with the agency, I think in part because they they know I respect them. I had a great time, right? I'm not one of those people who left and 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 talks bad about right. because I had I just had a great time. I was lucky in that sense, right? And had worked for amazing people and and worked with people that were tremendous. Um and so as long as you understand what you are not supposed to say, right? And you sign secrecy agreements. And those secrecy, they, they don't have a, a shelf life, right? You know, it's not as if, okay, it's 10 years on, now I can... <laughs> I right. can now go, go on yeah. TV and you, you take that, list out yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. You, you, so you take that to your grave, and you need to respect that. Right? Um, so, and the agency, they, they were very good to me, right, when I left. Because, you know, the, their point was, well, don't leave. You know, at first, it was, it was sort of like, don't leave, because what else are you going to do? <laughs> I mean, look at you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but I mean, they meant it in a kind way, you sure. know. And then when I did go to leave, they said, to the degree that we can, you should leave and be able to say that you were here, right? And so that's a process in itself. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really realize the value of that at the time because I didn't, you know, again, no business experience. So getting out um, and being able to do that, that opened some doors that I hadn't really anticipated. And so that was a, a very good thing. How different do you think the agency is now, the CIA specifically, from when you were involved? Because my guess is 20 years ago, there was a, I don't want to speak for you, but there right. was probably a certain level of trust in the institution that now, at least from the outside, seems, seems let's say, shaky at best. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of that. And that's real. Yeah. That, that's a real problem. Um, I'll, I'll be honest with you. When I was in the agency for, well, you know, again, going on two decades, I don't ever remember having a political discussion. We never sat in a safe house. And you could spend a lot of time sitting in the safe house waiting for something to pop, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, for whatever reason, you know, the target's not available or you're waiting for headquarters to say, yeah, let's do it. We never had conversations sitting around talking politics. It just wasn't a thing, mm -hmm. right? And the agency itself is is always supposed to be apolitical. I mean, it's human, right? So people are going to have their opinions and that's fine. You know, but you know, you keep it in check, right? Sure. Um, and so obviously the rub now is that that's not the case, right? Both for the agency and the bureau. The bureau's taking a real kicking. Yeah. And and I think that's a real shame because everybody I know, including at the bureau, um, and these are operators, right? These are the agents at the bureau, these are the officers at the at the uh, CIA. They're, they're terrific, right? And they're not political. And they, and they just do what they're supposed mm -hmm. to do. Right? And the agency's job is very simple, right? You protect the, the interests of the, national, uh, of, of, of the nation, you know, national security concerns. And the administration tells you what are your priorities, uh, whichever administration's in charge, and then you just march on and do it, mm -hmm. right? But obviously the rub is now it's become a political organization. I would argue the same thing that's been argued about the Bureau, which is that takes place at a much higher level, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, the director, uh, that's a political position, essentially, appointed by the president. And, yeah, you can get a director who's, you, who's too enamored with politics, with, too enamored with being at the White House, too enamored with that, you know, the tightness of, of that relationship and, and what it means. Uh, you can get others, too, who are, you know, more senior. But, I can't speak for now, but I can speak for when I was there. Yeah. It wasn't a, a political organization. And you understood that because 
we spent our time in some real shitholes overseas, right? In some very difficult environments where the tradition was if the government was overthrown and they seemed to be getting overthrown a lot, <laughs> then next thing you know, they'd just sweep out the military, they'd sweep out the intel organization, whatever the organization they had, and they'd install their buddies, their friends, those that they knew were be rock solid loyal. And you see how awful that was mm-hmm. and what it would mean to the, that, that particular country. And so, you know, you had a real understanding that that was never to happen with the agency. So, yeah, I think we have to always be on guard about that. But the best way to, to guard against it, unfortunately, is to have a very uh, proactive and curious and demanding um, oversight by the uh, intel committees up on Capitol Hill. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, I say unfortunately because... <laughs> My theory is we really don't send our best and brightest right. to Capitol Hill. Right. So there's a couple of prong problem here. Yeah. Sort of politics have been injected into the agencies and then the oversight committees, obviously the congressional oversight committees, as you said, these are not yeah. the best and the brightest. Yeah. So do you think there's anything that can be done to bring some of that trust back? I mean, especially on the Republican side now, yeah. you're hearing candidates say, you know, just blow away the agencies oh, altogether and, and yeah. a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah. But like, what, what, yeah. Would, what would look at like a sort of sane reformation? as these things have become political. Yeah, yeah. I, I hear that talk when people say, we got to fire them all. You know, whether they're talking about the agency, or they're talking about the FBI, or whatever. Yeah. Or just shut it down. You think, you know, look, okay, you're obviously too stupid, right, to represent anybody. You know, how did you possibly get up on Capitol Hill? No, look, there's some very bright people. I know a couple of the people on the on the intel committees that are super smart, one of them from, from Idaho, uh, Senator Risch, right? They're some very good people. But we also have some morons, right? So I don't want to paint them all with the same brush. But um, I think what would a what would a logical step be? I think one of the things that needs to be done is that the after nine eleven they created uh, you know uh, the DNI position, right? Mm-hmm. And they they basically collapsed everything into one organization from the intel community, right? All the various intel agencies. And the CIA director was kind of pushed to the side, right? In favor of the DNI, who then, you know, sort of had that job of sitting in the White House more. It's important to have a better line of communication between the director of the agency and the Oval Office, right? Now, you know, you can well make the argument that it just depends on the president, right? Because some presidents are better at, at that relationship. They pay sure. more attention. You know, there was always the rub on, on Trump that he didn't read uh, the, uh, the briefings that came in. Um, others read every page, right? It just depends on the person. But I guess my point is, I think one of the problems we've got is, is we don't have a, a better line of communication between the agency directly and, and the Oval Office. It's too important an organization, particularly in today's times, mm-hmm. um, to relegate it to just a member of the intel community. Um, otherwise, I think that you've got to have better vetting of the senior leadership right, in terms of when they're appointed. right, And that, again, is job of the intel committees, mm-hmm. Congress mm-hmm. and Senate. And then, like I said, once you get below that senior level, people are just doing their job. They yeah. honest to God, don't give a shit who's in charge. Just, you know, on the professional level, sure. just tell us what the hell the mission is. Do you, do you have any sense of how much DEI has infected that level? That The level that you're well, saying is pretty solid? Because yeah, yeah. my guess is that would be the level that would get hit it's, the hardest. It's it been hit, yes. And, and it's there. Right. They've they've done what everybody else has done. Right. They played the game of, of DEI. And um, I've seen a couple of the recruiting ads that they've run. Um, look, uh, the agency was a, an old boy network. Right. Kind of the original days yeah. after World War Two. It was very much a, like a Yaley operation. Right. Ivy Leagues and somebody get a tap on the shoulder and then be recruited. And yes, you got a very homogenous looking group, you know. Um, so, but from an operational perspective, you want a real mix, right? Mm-hmm. So rather than being told that we're doing this because it, you know, makes the world a better place from a DEI perspective, I'd rather see the director instruct everyone saying, 
we operate all around the globe sure. and we better blend in, right? In this case, there are reasons there are you want people of different colors and different solid, languages. Exactly, and, and, exactly. It's a perfect yeah. reason. You don't have to play the DEI game because you need to have that right. operational you know, diversity. And, and so you know, to me, you know, having a, an equity officer or a DEI you know, director or whatever, is, is, is just bullshit. It's nonsense, right? Just do your job, which is get out there and hire the best and brightest to operate around the globe, right? And yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's, you raise an interesting point with it. Let's, uh, let's shift to some of the fires in the world right now. There are many fires, but as we sit here, as we sit here right now, just I think about two hours ago, the Biden administration has reinstated the Houthis as a terrorist organization. Yeah. Um, they were a terrorist organization under Trump. Biden, one of the first things he came in and did was undo that. Mm -hmm. Now we got a big problem. Can you explain who the Houthis? Give me like Houthi 101. What's going on in Yemen? Can you clean that up for for the average person that's just watching another yeah. fire in the world and going, yeah, why should I care? Why does this matter? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the yeah the Houthis. Um, we see the dancing videos. They've got a great choreographer. Over oh my there god! Get the yeah. guys out there with the music. Yeah. And but, I tell you what, you, you want to? I mean, the Sanaa, the capital of Yemen. Is a, is a fascinating place, right? Um, it's very interesting. And it's an interesting culture. It's a, it's a, it's a really, you know, that, and that's the thing. You look at it and go, okay, well, you guys are pretty fucked up, but it's a, it's a fascinating place, <laughs> great history, great culture. Let's, let's get this under control. But they, they basically have had a civil war in Yemen uh, raging for quite some time. And I, I don't want to oversimplify this, but um, a lot of the violence, a lot of the death, a lot of the instability uh, in that region, if you say, well, what the hell's going on? It's essentially a Sunni Shia mm -hmm. problem, right? So the Saudis, you know, you know they're you know, Sunni. Um, Iran, Shia, right? If, if, if you know nothing else about it, then just, you know, you kind of say, yeah, okay, kind of the same yeah, you got two teams and they're, they're, and they're going at each other in terms of, of, of their belief systems. Um, Iran has been supporting the Houthis. Uh, they, they, they find it uh, in their best interest. Iran is... People say this all the time. People say Iran is the state sponsor, of, the largest state sponsor of terrorism. What does that mean? It means that they have built up proxies right? um, in, in the Middle East, in part to uh, satisfy their, one of their primary objectives, which is to destroy Israel. So they have built, essentially, and sponsored and funded and trained and resourced Hezbollah up in Lebanon. Um, uh, Hamas, um, uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, um, and the Houthis in, in Yemen. I'll, I'll stick with those three for now, but they're all uh, creations, essentially, of Israel, or of uh, Iran. If, if Iran didn't provide them with support and funding and guidance and training and missiles <laughs> and weapons, um, you know, we wouldn't be talking about this today, mm -hmm. right? Because Hamas wouldn't, wouldn't be anywhere near where it is, right? Um, but they do Iran's bidding in a sense. I'm oversimplifying a little bit. Mm -hmm. They've got their own interests as well, but, but that's where they take their guidance from for the most part. So you've got, uh, you've got the Houthis sitting in Yemen. They claim that they've started this latest issue, this, 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 this rocketing of commercial and now U.S. Navy warships in the Red Sea in sympathy and support of Hamas, right, and uh, against Israel. It's not as if the Houthis sat there to themselves. You know, they, they, they're in a very tenuous ceasefire right now mm -hmm. in, their, in their, their, uh, their conflict with the, they don't control, they're not recognized as the government of, of Yemen. Um, the government, the recognized government of Yemen is supported by the Saudis, right? Um, the Houthis supported by the Iranians, but there's a, a very tenuous ceasefire there that exists. It's not as if the Houthis would have said to themselves on their own without Iranian encouragement and guidance, you know what we should do? We should take some of these Iranian-provided missiles and anti-ship missiles and start blasting them out and really disrupting global trade. Mm -hmm. right? That the Red Sea channel, that, that accounts for, you know, 15%, 17% of, of global shipping traffic, mm -hmm. right? Um, most major shipping lines, Maris, Kapagloid, um, and most major companies, Shell, uh, BP, others, just shut down their operations. They're rerouting all their traffic around uh, uh, the Cape of Good Hope. So mm -hmm. that adds extra days, adds about nine days on, on depending on the routes we're talking about. That's fuel costs, that's crew costs, that's shipping, that's it's just everything mm -hmm. that gets into that. 
uh, everything starts to, to become a problem. And so the Houthis, it's not like they did this on their own. Um, what our problem is from a U.S. perspective and, and our allies' perspective is that the Biden administration currently um, won't address the primary driver of all this, which is Iran, right? So the Iranians made the calculation, the regime, not the people, but the history of Iran's fantastic, yep, right? Yep. Um, and the people are great, but it's the regime and the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard Corps, they know, because they've been doing this for a long time, that they can continue to destabilize the region and they're not gonna be paying for it directly, right? Mm-hmm. Any, any response is gonna be directed at one of their proxies. Right. right? So that was, that was a calculation they made. The Biden administration is, is playing that out for sure. You know, they, at, at early on in the conflict, they didn't want to talk about Iran. Right? Mm-hmm. Now they've at least mentioned it obliquely. This designation that you raise is interesting because President Trump did designate them as a foreign terrorist organization. You've got different levels of designation, right? Uh, when, you, when you say, okay, that group, Hamas, or that group over there, you know, we want to designate them as terrorists. You can, you can do that at various levels, and it has different impacts in terms of what actions can then be taken against the group. Mm-hmm. So the Trump administration lay, listed the uh, Houthis as a foreign terrorist organization, and then um, I don't know, Trump in February of 21, or sorry, Biden when he came in, yep. so it was February of 2021, reversed that decision. And he reversed it because the UN and others were saying, oh, this is terrible. You know, you can't keep them on the terrorist list because it's hurting, you know, Yemen. It's hurting the people of Yemen. And, you know, they're not getting humanitarian aid. And, and well, you know, most of that humanitarian aid was getting rifled through by the, by the Houthis anyway. Right. It sounds it. exactly like what's happened with Hamas and with Hezbollah. Exactly. Basically. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Hamas is, the, the leadership is rich because of all the billions that they control when money and aid goes into Gaza, right? Mm-hmm. They, so anyway, but with the, with the Houthis, the, the Biden administration had no choice, I think from a, an optic from, for politics. Um, they realized, okay, we now have to reverse our own decision. So now they've, this Oh, you week, mean they had no choice now? Then, yes. do you think yeah. then the, the idea was, well, Trump did it, so we're just gonna reverse oh, yeah. it? yeah, like, like everything else. Essence, yeah. yeah, I think like everything else, with the border decisions, you know, that they took on the border, it, ridiculous, right? But yeah. it was that idea that like, oh, Trump did it, it must've been bad, yeah. right? And so let's, let's just change it all because that'll show how righteous we are, right? So they did that with the Houthis. Um, and now, now they've decided to go and reverse their thinking because they have no choice, right? I mean, it, the news, the media has finally picked up on this and said, mm-hmm. okay, there's a lot going on here and we're being targeted. Uh, it's only a matter of time, you know, before something bad happens. And then, so I think they wanted to get ahead of it a little bit, right? Um, and so what they've done is they haven't gone with the foreign terrorist organization designation. They went with a lesser designation, which is the specially designated global terrorist, right? So uh, whatever that is, that's an acronym. I'm sure it's a government acronym, <laughs> SGDT. Right. So um, that is still important. No, don't get me wrong. I'm glad they did it, but um, it's not the strongest that they could, the action that they could take against the Houthis. So what they've done here is they're saying, okay, you know, we're going to designate you as terrorists. You're, we're going to call you terrorists. <laughs> but and that can allow us to, to freeze assets in, in, to a degree, but it still allows for humanitarian aid to go in. Uh, again, the problem is if it goes into Hodeida, if it goes into the port, main right. port there in, 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 uh, in, in Yemen, that's controlled by uh, the Houthis. So humanitarian aid, will, you know, whether it gets to the actual people who deserve it, need it, et cetera, just like with the citizens of Gaza. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's anybody's guess. How much of this, of the craziness that we're seeing right now, whether it's in Gaza or whether it's in Yemen and what's going on with the with Red Sea and everything is connected back to the $6 billion that just, you know, a couple of weeks before October 7th, they were saying, oh, well, it's it's fungible. Who knows what yeah. they're going to do with it? After they had originally said, <laughs> yeah. no, we can't go to certain things. And then suddenly it was like, oh, we gave them the cash. Well, we'll see. Yeah, yeah, don't know. Yeah, we can't, we can't keep track of our own money here. Yeah. I'm sure we can watch it, you know, right, money exactly. going out of, flowing out of Qatar for, uh, for, for uh, the Iranians. Yeah, I, you know what? 
I think it was a, it was a, a definitely the wrong move. It was a stupid move. Uh, it was misguided on their part. Um, did it contribute to what's going on now? Not really, because the Iranians have been making bank off of oil anyway, mm-hmm. right? They've been making money. So I'm not saying that the $6 billion wasn't important because it, it was, right? And um, and in other additional funds that were going there, you know, it was that wasn't the only tranche of money that went to the Iranian regime uh, from the Biden administration. But they were making money anyway because we haven't, we haven't clamped down on on you know their primary source of revenue, which mm-hmm. is energy, right? Mm-hmm. Same with Russia. Mm-hmm. You know we've got made the same mistake with Putin, and you know the Iranians are are selling and you know from uh, or to uh, China and and Russia, um, so they have buyers, right? Um, but it does point to just this misguided foreign policy that the Biden administration has had towards Iran, and I get it. You know they they were doing what they believed in, you know, administration comes in, they, they're going to make their own decisions. But it seems, it seems opposite of what history has told us, right? Every time the U.S. has extended their hand, right, to, you know, try to, you know, make some deal or negotiate or make peace with the Ryans, they just, the regime smacks it away, right? And they keep on doing what they've been doing. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, I don't know why they expected to get some different reaction. So, so what do you think a resolution of this looks like? So now we've, you know, there we've deemed them a terrorist organization on the slightly lower mm. designation, mm. but they're most likely not going to stop right now. So, right. so what does a resolution look like to get those ports functioning again? That well, route, that route open. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if Iran told the Houthis to stop, they would stop. Right. That's that's the only, you know, channel that, that's going to work with, with the Houthis. Um, if all we do is, is fire a few counter-strikes at Houthi stockpiles of missiles, et cetera, and, and most of those missiles are mobile anyway, right? So we have a hell of a time uh, trying to do target identification, you know, create target packages that are going to degrade, you know, their capabilities sufficiently. They did these last counter-strikes that they did over the past couple of days with the British as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was some other support that came in from other allies. Uh, you know, according to, you know, the military anyway, they feel like they may be degraded about 25% of their capabilities, right? Uh, you know, that's probably really a, an aggressive estimate. Mm-hmm. And I doubt it, it's that much. So, yeah, how do, you, how do you stop this? How do you stop the other instability, right? Look, Hamas personnel were in Iran training leading up to 7 October, right? Um, th- their stockpile of weapons, the stockpile of weapons that, that Hezbollah is sitting on, it, everything, it, it's all emanating from Iran. Mm-hmm. They all have the same, I mean, the Houthis have the same goal. They, they've got it, on, their slogan is on their flag, right? Mm-hmm. Death to America, death to Israel, right? Um, that's the objective. And, and so unless we have an actual uh, deterrence strategy targeting Iran, not their proxies, because that's what they expect and they've made that calculation that they're good with it um, because it's worked for them, then nothing's going to change. I I suspect you don't think that's coming, though, with this administration. No, no, no. And I'm not saying it's a good thing. Nobody wants, you know, look, the the, the conflict in, in Gaza, that's a war that Hamas started, right? So the only people that wanted that war Right, were Hamas and and in uh, Iran. Right. right, nobody else asked for it, and, and so um, nobody wants conflict. Nobody wants war. Nobody wants anybody, you know, killed. I mean, you know, c- civilian deaths are, are are tragic, but we're going to have to do something because if you know, if uh, if we just continue down this same path as far as the regime goes, they are shortening that breakout window for their nuclear program, mm-hmm. right? And they are also at the same time shortening their ability or, or the time it's going to take them to have a delivery system that's capable, right? And because uh, you, you, know, you get a nuke, you got to put it on something, right? Mm-hmm. So <laughs> you can tell I'm a, I'm a nuclear weapons specialist. Yeah. <laughs> that was, you do have to yeah. put it on something. You got to put it on something. Otherwise, the next day in the office, <laughs> no, no, ain't going to be great. Sorry. Right. You're not going to send it by FedEx. Um, so uh, it, it, it would be a lot easier to deal with the regime now in a mm-hmm. targeted fashion. And right? I'm not saying we go to war with Iran, although if anybody thinks that that war would, you know, I mean, it would be messy for a while. But, you know, we've got the ability, right? And, our, and, and look, the, 
Are the Saudis going to get upset about it? Absolutely not. Right. Right. Are they going to come out publicly and go, yeah, yeah, no. But a, a, a number of countries in that region ha- would have no problems with Iran, the regime, again, getting punched in the nose and told, you know, in, in no uncertain fashion, this has got to stop. You have got to stop this. This, is, this does nothing for the community of nations. And, you know, but again, I don't think that's going to happen. And nobody wants that to happen. But I don't see any other resolution to this. Let's connect that to, uh, you mentioned Hamas a couple of times. We, I took my team to Israel in May, and my main takeaway of 10 days there was how mm-hmm. peaceful it was, ironically. Mm-hmm. That, that really was my, especially yeah. especially in Jerusalem. But when we were up north and we went to some of the, the stations that they have there right on the border where you can see Hezbollah mm-hmm. literally you know, a hundred yards away, something like that. And we went, we, we started going down a tunnel and the guy started yelling at me. I, they took us into the tunnel. Oh. I started walking down. The guy's like, you can't walk down there, <laughs> but you can see it. Um, what was interesting to me is that there seemed to be way more concern about what was happening up North than there was related to Gaza. Yeah. Now there's a problem up North for sure, Yeah, but clearly Gaza was the, the thing that was about to explode. I mean, Israel's an obscenely tiny country with, yeah, basically people that want to blow them apart every which way. What what should they be doing right now? They've got North Gaza, but they're still hostages. Right. I mean, what, what, what's a, yeah. what's a sane strategy? What, what gets them out of this? Well, uh, yeah. First of all, I will say this. I was about to say something about Hezbollah, but first of all, I'll give it a, a travel, uh, promo for Lebanon. Mm-hmm. Lebanon is a fantastic country. Beirut is an amazing city and the Lebanese people are incredible. Great people. Right? I'm not talking about Hezbollah. Yeah. But I'm talking about, <laughs> right. I'm talking about the other. Um, well, the Lebanese people don't yeah. love Hezbollah. No, they're, no. They're sort of held hostage by them. Yes. Yeah. And, right? and you could argue the same for a lot of the citizenry in Gaza, right? I mean, they understand that they've been screwed over by Hamas, right? All that money, you mm-hmm. know? You think about how many billions of dollars and what that could have done for the people of Gaza. You know, clean water systems, schools, uh, you know, better road infrastructure, communications, all these things. And, and, but you've got these assholes you know, who, who siphoned it all off um, and, you know, and extorted the people for using the tunnels for moving commerce and everything else. I mean, it's, it's, it's an astounding thing. And yet somebody's, it's all Israel's fault. Somebody's yeah. got to pay the bills for the Mandarin Oriental and, uh, and Qatar. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but you're right. They've, the military, the IDF uh, for, the, for Israel um, basically is in a position now where they feel as if they've got northern Gaza under control. So they've been withdrawing. They've been pulling their people out, right, and, and, and equipment. And they're doing the same thing in, slowly in the South, right? But the South, as you pointed out, is more of an issue, right? More fighters, um, some leadership still located down there. And the one, and the the one truth here, and the hostages, yeah. And, and, and although, again, trying to get intelligence on where those hostages are located, I mean, there's been a lot of time that's passed, right? You can, and, and, so the movement of these individuals, right, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. But again, there's one group responsible for this, right? This, this, this is not something that Israel asked for. So they've got to deal with it in the, in, in the best sense. And, and you, you pointed out a very, I don't think people understand how small Israel is. And again, Iran circled them with groups that mm-hmm. they, they helped build that all believe in destroying Israel, right? So they have circled them with these terrorist organizations to, to accomplish this. Uh, Hamas was very smart. Um, the, the, and I suspect the RGC liaison was involved in this relatively long-term project of disinformation mm-hmm. to, you know, essentially lull the Israeli government into this sense of, okay, well, Hamas doesn't want conflict and Hamas you know, is, is good. And so we're going to open up more in terms of work opportunities and, and, and allow more free flow of citizens from between Gaza and Israel for work. And, and that was a, a very intense covert action campaign, right, to, to do that. And I think they also realized once we did that, once we took away, at least in the minds of some within the Israeli government, this idea that Hamas was a, a daily, everyday threat and they wanted conflict and they were looking to cause once you did that, then that opened up the door for the government to kind of look inward, right? And then mm-hmm. you started getting more infighting within the, 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 yeah. the, uh, the government. And I think that that encouraged uh, Hamas and whoever was guiding the strategy. Uh, I guarantee you these rocket scientists didn't come up with it on their own. And so, yeah, that, that part of it was, was fascinating. And then when you think about, yeah, 
I don't know. I, I, I guess the, the, the point I was, I'm trying to make there is they combined that with the operational side leading up to 7 October. Mm-hmm. Again, guided and trained um, by the IRGC in Iran and their personnel that were based in Gaza and helping out. Um, they understood the importance of dumbing this down, right? And so people talk about what an f- intelligence failure it was, and it was definitely on the, on the Israel's part, on Mossad and, and IDF and others. But in part, it was driven by the fact that Hamas understood what they had to do leading up to this, right? So their communications patterns changed, mm-hmm. right? They dumbed down their, their, so there was less SIGINT to pick up or potential communications intercept. Um, they, they had a real understanding of where they were going with this. Um, but how do you, you know, what's, if they, if this conflict ends tomorrow or ends a month from now or two months from now and Hamas in some form is still intact and, and running Gaza, then the only winners are Hamas and and Iran, Mm -hmm. right? And the violence will continue and the terrorism will continue and all it. So the, the, the one key truth that Netanyahu said at the beginning was we have to destroy Hamas. Mm-hmm. We have to make sure they can never, ever do this again. That's a, that's a tough, you know, tough call, and it's, and it's operationally not feasible in the sense you can't wipe them all out. But you can try. Well, what would you say to people who say there's no military solution? That's a big thing you hear in Democrat or left-leaning circles. There's no mm-hmm. military solution to this thing. It's like yeah. there's always a military solution. It's, it's always not a military the most solution. pleasant thing in the world. Right. But- but right. it's war. Yeah, it is. And, and, and I would say th- those people that talk about, well, there's no military solution, that's a really simplistic concept, right? And usually they have no experience <laughs> in, a, right. in a hostile environment. We, but, we did things in World War II that, that gave a military solution. I yeah, mean. yeah. But you combine it with other things, right? Yeah. It doesn't, just because you, you're focused here doesn't mean you're also not doing other things uh, concurrently on mm-hmm. different tracks, you know, whether it's negotiations, whether it's coming up with what does this governance look like when we finish with this conflict? They've got to get themselves to a point where they feel they have degraded Hamas because you're not going to remove them entirely or you're not going to destroy them entirely. They've got to get to the point where they feel they've degraded them sufficiently that they are not a factor going forward, right? And they also understand because they knew going into this, right? They knew well before anyone did what the narrative was going to be as soon as they moved on their operations inside Gaza. That the narrative would change to, oh my God, Palestinians are dying, right? Mm-hmm. And look how many are dying. By the way, the media never questions the statistics that come from the Hamas controlled Ministry of Health. Right, right. right. The Ministry of Health from a terrorist organization. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Oh, yeah. sure, we'll take that. We'll take that information. Uh, and so they've got they've got to get to that point where they understand that, you know, from their intelligence and from what the, the targets they've been able to take out and the leadership they've been able to terminate, that they've accomplished that. They also, but they did understand that the narrative would turn quickly. I don't think they expected it to turn as quickly as it did, mm-hmm. right, given how brutal the 7 October attacks were, but, um, but it did. And now you have a lot of useful idiots out there protesting on their behalf and on the Houthis' behalf. Right. What do you think, mm-hmm. uh, just to bring that back to the mm-hmm. domestic side for a second, and then we'll move to another, another part of the world altogether. Uh, when you see all these protests all over the world, but specifically in America, when you see these protests and they're protesting river to the sea, all of this stuff we've got, you know, they're protesting at the White House, they're mm-hmm. pulling on the fence, vandalizing all this stuff. Like, are the agencies paying attention to that? Like, I think most people are watching that going, doesn't even matter what you think of what's going on in the Middle East. Most people are watching that like, didn't we do this a couple of years ago? Didn't we burn down our cities a couple yeah. of years ago? Why is no one ever arrested at these things? Are yeah. you just allowed, if it was a bunch of white people showing up at the White House with oh. hands up? Yeah. What would be happening? So what, what's going on at the agency? I know it's not exactly yeah. what the agencies are supposed to be doing protecting the White House, but it's intelligence involved, right? Yeah. Uh, we have a good example of what happens when a bunch of people show up and rattle fences and break <laughs> exactly. in. We know, we know what happens when they're wearing, you know, MAGA hats. Right. That's fine. And, and, and they, they should have been punished, right? I mean, there's the, um, uh, but at the same time, the inconsistency right. of the way they came down on that and then you know, we disappeared on that rabbit hole, but they were very smart. I give the Democrats very, uh, a, 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 you know, a lot of credit for being clever and sticking to a message because early on in that, they started using that word insurrection, mm-hmm. right? And they knew what they were doing, right? They, they understood if we, can, if we can beat this narrative, right? That allows us to then do what they're doing now in terms of trying to, you know, strike Trump off the, the ballots. 
So the, I, in all the, your I, yeah. years, did you ever see any other insurrection where no one had a set of plans and nobody brought weapons? Did strolled, there? strolled around, took pictures. Yeah. Can we look, just you know, move this barrier yeah. out of the way? And yeah. Look, around? I mean, the people that, you know, there had to be consequences for the people who were, were violent. Sure. Right. Sure. The, of course. But, um, you know, at the same time, yeah, the Democrats knew what they were doing. They, they played this one up. And then people see in general, I don't I don't think it's just Republicans. I think it's both sides. Human nature, you know, you want to see consistency. You want right. to see the same. And so they look and they see this and they think whether it's the Antifa riots or or what took place in front of the White House. And they go, how how is this working? Because it seems not consistent in terms of the way things get dealt with. But yeah, the the the. the is that connected purely to the politics of the agency, the agencies that we were talking about earlier? Or is that, mm. is that something else? No, I think that's a top-down thing from the administration, right? And that's, that's a politics thing where they, uh, it, it's not because the, the agency has nothing to do with, with that, right? That's a, that's a secret service issue, a uh, capital police issue, uh, not, not even capital police. They, well, yeah, yeah, they could have a little bit of jurisdiction, I suppose, maybe. Right. Well, I guess uh, I, meant, police, I guess I meant yeah. more in terms of information snatching on the ground in those groups, figuring out who's connected to who. And, oh, yeah, that's you know, a bureau thing. Yeah. yeah, that would also be a bureau thing. Um, yeah. And 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 you're right. They, you know, they'd want to know, you know, who's there. They they they. But most of those people out there couldn't find Gaza on a people, map. Oh yeah, right. I mean, and, and some of them are you know, being busted. They, like, they don't the even know what they're States doing, right? They're yeah. getting a free t-shirt and the hat and, you know, yeah. they get to go out and, you know, and, and some are there because it makes them feel righteous, you know, and they like that. And, and, um, they get to say, yeah, look, and they get to, you know, I, I don't know. And then some are, you know, trust fund protesters, you know, they're wealthy. You know, I, I will say this, that people talk about, oh, you know, um, we're all divided. Right. Well, everybody, you know, and, and it's been become very divisive and, and the demographics are getting sliced and diced. The only group I can't stand are privileged progressives, you know, <laughs> right? Because yeah. they're just it's the self-righteousness that drives me crazy. And, and some of that plays into these protests. Yeah, there are you, you get others who are out there who have been worried about this cause, you know, for most of their lives. So God bless them. Right. You got to you know, And we have the right to peaceful protest. I'm just saying that. In I these, crowd, the, in I these crowds, the, you got a lot of idiots. Sure, yeah, I yeah, would put yeah. the pure jihadists with the uh, progress, the righteous progressive moron. I would yeah. say that they're kind of the same. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the I same mean, bar. Yeah, I don't I mean got jihadists. You. I, got I mean, you. like, like, like You're, of yeah. Palestinian descent, right? right? Who have lived here now and and you know yeah. have family over there. And they, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, I get that. Right? Sure, but. You look at some of the college campuses and you think, you, you kids, what the hell are you doing? You're doing this because you think it's cool yeah. right? and it's trendy and you're looking for something to, to do, you know, and, and by God, you can get out there and, and feel clever. Um, queers for Palestine is very different than Palestine for queers. Yes. I yes. I think yeah. that's how it works. Uh, you want to go to the Far East now or do you want to go to Eastern Europe? Which way do you, um, depends which way around the globe you, you want to go. You choose. We should have, you know what we could do? Yeah. We could do this monthly and you could have like a wheel that would yeah. spin. Right, <laughs> that good. wheel of shit. We may yeah. well, we may have to because none of these problems are going away. All right, why don't why don't we go to the Far East then? Because Taiwan just had elections. Uh, yeah. they, they looked pretty legit. I mean, people were actually holding tickets, and there yeah. were people checking things, and it all kind of seemed like, oh, that's how it could work in functioning yeah. uh, democracies. Uh, but there's a big situation going on with Chi China, Taiwan, mm -hmm. independence. Are they seeing American weakness? Et cetera, et cetera. I'm just kind yeah. Of no, you're right. You're right. Uh, it, it it was a tidy election. It was a tidy election, and they they sorted it out, and they were able to call it. You know, <laughs> why didn't take them months? One day, yeah. Um, yeah, but um, yeah. The 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 problem uh, from China's perspective is that the wrong party won, right? So they were they were pushing. There were basically three parties, and and they were contesting this, but there were only two that were seriously contesting it. And one was the, the Democratic um, People's Party, the DPP, and the other was the Kuomintang Party. And the Kuomintang Party uh, is very much in favor of closer relations with China. Mm -hmm. China was very much hopeful that they would win. They didn't. The DPP won. Uh, the vice president of the DPP became, or uh, of, the, of the government became the president, the new president, William Lai. And um, they've been fairly vocal about the importance of Taiwan's independence and now that that word means a little something different right when you talk to the taiwanese people they can be pro we want taiwan to be independent and free they don't mean 
you know, rattle the cage and be completely separate, you know, from China. They sure. still believe in the importance of that relationship, right? So we sometimes think about it and go, okay, they're going to have a revolution and declare their independence and everything. And it's not really what they're talking about. But <clears throat> even having some space between the idea of reunification, mm -hmm. uh, or basically Beijing taking over Taiwan, um, that is something that Xi, uh, Xi Jinping won't, won't counter. So he doesn't, he doesn't want to hear that. So does it matter in a way what happens in their elections? I mean, I know mm. at least temporarily it's good for the Taiwanese people, of course, to be able right. to express themselves. But ultimately, if China wants Taiwan, it's going to take Taiwan, at least, at least with this administ American administration, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that they've, um, the, the calculation is more about, um, is, is not so much about who's in the White House as how long is Xi Jinping going to stay head of China, right? Um, I think he views uh, the reunification idea, bringing Taiwan back into the fold uh, as his key legacy. So I think if you could magically figure out when he's going to finish up being, you know, the sort of this iron fisted ruler of China, then you could say, okay, between now and that point in time in the future, that's when something's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's going to be, uh, you know, military. They don't want, China doesn't want to uh, have to worry about a military takeover. And they've talked about this, sort of the, the soft approach. Mm -hmm. And we, you can kind of see what they did with Hong Kong, right? They, that was accelerated and helped in part by the pandemic, right? We were all over here looking, you know, at this. And, and, uh, and they kind of stamped out the last vestiges of democracy, you know, during that time. And, it happened, right? Now that's a little bit different, right? You know, in a sense, because you know, Hong Kong was always sort of temporarily leased, <laughs> sort of, right? There was always a sense that it was going back. Right. And, and so it's not quite the same, but they brutally stamped out the democracy movement there. And so I think, you know, their, their view on Taiwan, um, despite the fact that there's almost no distance, you know, in the strait there between the two, uh, is they don't want to do it militarily. And, and I think, um, you know, they are intent on doing it. They've been very clear, particularly during the past year. She has made some very clear statements that it is inevitable, is what he's saying. And so, yeah, the Taiwanese people look at that and go, you know, and there's some that, that want that reunification, you mm -hmm. know, and, but, uh, you know, the majority want things to be essentially the way they are, right? And it um, sort of seems like if they think Trump's coming back in a year, they might want to escalate that the speed of that, right? That's why, what G might want to do. There could be that calculation, but I, they play a longer game. You know, we take everything in very small bite-sized chunks. And that doesn't typically happen in, in China. You know, they, they play whether it's this sort of issue or whether it's an intelligence operation or anything. They play a real long game, you know. So I, I don't think we want to read too much into the, just the change in administration. What uh, what does generally sane China policy look like to you? Like, I think people hear what you said about Iran, and it's like you can sort of like make sense of it in your brain. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. there are weapons in these places. Mm -hmm. There are trade routes being shot at. There's mm -hmm. people being murdered. That's not how we look at China. China's doing a lot of other things related to technology, <laughs> related to releasing yeah. COVID, let's say. Like, there's some other stuff, but it's yeah. a little more TikTok. It's a little more amorphous versus just like military stations in countries. Right. TikTok has been, I mean, people talk about TikTok. The Chinese regime would never allow their children to have access to TikTok, right? They have a different uh, uh, WeChat, right? You know, uh, which is a cleaned up version. Right. <laughs> so it's not on my phone, yeah. it's on that guy's phone over there. Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I told him he didn't have to do it, but he wanted <laughs> he to did. do it. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, but what, but what do you, what is like sensible policy related to all that related to like an information war that's happening to our yeah, young people? Yeah. And, and yeah. I will say that one of the things that, that, uh, that the previous president that Trump did, um, you know, and you know, love him or hate him. Right. You know, he's, he's, as a personality, he's not my cup of tea. I lived in New York for a long time. People in New York who had a chance to watch it. He's a, he's a, he's a tri-state area yeah. developer. That, that's right? where I'm from. I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, you get punched in the nose, you punch the other guy in the nose. I mean, yeah. it's a, you, people there knew what, what was happening and what the guy was going to be like. Nobody thought he was going to suddenly become a sophisticated, you know, thoughtful individual who was going to be presidential. That, mm -hmm. you know, but one of the things that he did that was very smart and I think very useful was to elevate the, the conversation around China right? and to 
put a spotlight on just how much damage the Chinese regime and their intel apparatus has done over the decades, right, in terms of theft of intellectual property, the cost of that to us and to our allies, to the mm-hmm. West, um, and just the outright theft of research and development, right? Um, fentanyl, I mean. Fent- fentanyl, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, yes. Uh, so that's a, that's a whole separate, you know, counter-narcotics issue that, you know, but um, the, it's their, it's their intelligence operations. It's their economic espionage. Um, those things have done uh, damage that we can't even calculate the cost of over, over decades. Mm. Uh, in terms of lost opportunity, lost jobs, uh, lost um, you know, uh, revenue streams that could have you know, supported and built up other countries, other businesses. They're incredibly aggressive. Um, and then... You know, what, what they've been doing while we, again, kind of get focused in one area, whether it's Iraq, Afghanistan, um, domestic concerns, whatever it might be, we have a hard time, it seems, uh, multitasking. And again, with their sort of their longer view, they have a strategy. And so they've, they've spent uh, a couple of decades now traveling around the world. People, for the most part, know about this Belt and Road Initiative mm-hmm. that, that China has. Mm-hmm. But they've been going around locking up, as an example, uh, locking up uh, mining rights, yeah. right, in South America or in Africa um, for key minerals, right, critical and rare earth minerals. Uh, um, and it's the critical minerals that are really more important. I always thought, like, well, we call it rare earth, and people think, well, those are the important ones. And you're thinking, well, it's more really the critical minerals. They've been locking up uh, those opportunities, right? They have a monopoly on processing of, of key minerals that we're never going to get to 100% you know, green, um, because we don't have the ability to process, much less mine, but to process and refine those, those minerals for things that we need, such as, I don't know, batteries. Right? And so you hear this talk about, you know, uh, battery technology, how we're all going to go in that direction. And that's great. We should be doing lots of different things, right, for energy. But the Chinese knew that years ago, and they had a plan, and they've been doing this. Um, and they also do other things. They do things that are more insidious than just going around and cutting deals, right? Usually it's in a sort of a usury situation where the, the country finds out that they're doing a deal with that country, then finds out a few years later that they're completely in debt, can't afford the loans, end up having to give up more, mm-hmm. right? Um, but the, some of the insidious things that they do, the Chinese regime and the intel apparatus understood the importance of, of uh, regulatory uh, decisions, right? Regulations here in the U.S. and the impact that would have on things like mining, right? Uh, or agriculture. And so as an example, they're not trying necessarily, no, they are, but it's not, they don't consider it the most important part. They're influencing local communities. They're influencing local politics, state politics at that level, right? To make decisions about, about regulations. Um, Phosphate. Phosphate's a good example. It's a very good example, right? You like food, you like large scale agriculture to feed the world, better have some phosphate, mm-hmm. right? It's fertilizer. Yeah. So, uh, leading producers of, of, of phosphate, China, uh, Morocco, Russia, well, you know, just they're, they're up there. But so they, they understood if we go in and we impact local community decisions about you know, access to uh, phosphate mining, right? And, the, and, and we promote or we encourage, you know, through a variety of ways, right? Supporting local activist groups, supporting uh, operations that, you know, that they're more on a national basis that try to do environmental concerns, right? They're trying to do good things, right? They, the, these activists and the environment, they're t- it's not like it's nefarious and they say, if we could just cut a deal with the Chinese regime, but the Chinese regime understands this. And so through a variety of cutouts, mm-hmm. they're able to support these groups. And the next thing you know, whether it's down in Florida, you know, with phosphate or it's anywhere else, you know, towns or city councils are saying, no, nope, we don't want that. You know, we don't want, we're going to have to do something about this. Shut it down. That's an enormous benefit mm-hmm. <laughs> to a country that is the, you know, key producer of that mineral. So that's something that they do. And, that, that, and I, I'm, I've been fascinated by that because it shows, again, it shows this long view. And from an operational perspective, sometimes the problems with the, the CIA is that we, we tend to have a shorter view, right? We're Americans, and so yeah. that's just a tendency. And so our operations tend to have a shorter time frame concern, right? 
Um, we don't sometimes think about putting in the, the hard work of 10 to 20 years or 25 years to develop an asset, right? Or to develop a program that's going to eventually produce results. And, that's, and, that, and that also gets us exactly back to where we started, which mm-hmm. is why you don't want politics in the agency, because then that's going to flip that long-term thing because administrations are going to come and go. Right. L- let's just spend the remaining time going a little, we'll just, we went really far east, we'll kind of come back Sorry a little bit. Yeah, no, yeah, no, 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 yeah. let's, uh, yeah. uh, let's just do a little bit about Russia and Ukraine. My, mm. my basic position on this thing from the beginning was if we were going to do anything there, you got to be really careful because the guy's got nukes. So you can't just keep saying, okay, <laughs> arm him, arm him, arm him, because at the end of the day, if we got that close to the precipice, he's got nukes, so you better watch out. And not just and, nukes, he's got those things that you put them on. And the things that you mentioned before exactly. that they put them on yeah. and shoot them all over the place. Right. So that was sort of my position the whole time. And I, was, I just don't like blank checks to everybody and we're paying pensions for their people, all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. It seems to me it's sort of been pushed to the side at the moment because of October 7th. So we sort of stopped talking about yes. it. Yeah. Uh, but Zelensky's at the, the WEF right now in Davos. The war has not gone anywhere. I mean, wh- what in the what's going on there right yeah, now? Yeah, it is. It is fascinating, isn't it? Because it was uh, it was all Ukraine all day long, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and then seven October happened, and naturally that drew a lot of focus. But it is interesting that we again we have a hard time multitasking, mm-hmm. in, in, including in the media, where it's just like oh, I don't know. You we went for a couple of weeks before anybody thought is is there something going on still in the Ukraine? Right. Um, and and there is. They're in the the winter season, which is brutal over there. And they understood going into the winter season that there was going to be very little ground movement, right? And so it's, it's harder to, to redeploy troops. It's harder to move supplies. So they kind of hunker down. It's very World War uh, I-ish, right? You got the trench warfare. Literally, mm. the, Soviet, the, the Soviets, the Russians have built enormous trench uh, lines. Yeah. And I, it's, it's incredible. I was at the, the- It's hard to believe people still fight like that. It's hard to, yeah. you know, I, I was, I was going to say, I, I took the boys. I'm, I'm dual citizen. I was born in England. And uh, so, and the boys have their citizenship. So I took all three of them um, with uh, with my wife, who's the greatest person I'll, I'll ever know. And we went to London and I took them to the uh, Imperial War Museum. And anybody, you know, goes to London, they, they have to go to the Imperial War Museum. It's an amazing place. They have a World War One exhibit. So we're walking around, this was last, uh, last summer. We're walking through the exhibit and I've got the boys, uh, Scooter and Sluggo and Muggsy, and we're, we're walking through this World War One exhibit. And we're, and, and we're reading the, the, all the about the trench warfare, and we're reading about how it impacted uh, agriculture. And so it, it created food shortages, and it created all the things that were happening in World War I, and, and it was happening in, in Ukraine huh. at that moment. You think, how did we possibly regress? How did we go back to this? But we did, and so getting back to the present time, uh, the war has shifted its focus. Now it's a longer range war during the winter months, right? Um, and so what does that mean? That means the Ukrainians are, are using their available munitions, missiles to, um, to go after Russian supply lines further in to, uh, or further behind the lines mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and sometimes into Russia. And they're going after the command and control centers. And they're, they, so there's this long range battle. They're, they're trying to do more targeted uh, strategic strikes on, 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 uh, on leadership, right? And, and, and that's, a, that's, that's a hard lift. They're trying to, to uh, basically cut off Crimea. Right. And Putin's doing the same thing. He did the same thing last winter. He's lobbing missiles at infrastructure. He's trying to freeze out the Ukrainians during the winter months. Right. So he's hitting energy sources as much as he can. Um, and it's brutal. Right. And Russia's got a manpower problem, uh, but they have a three to one advantage just in sheer numbers. Right. right? <clears throat> so they're they're busy conscripting and, and, and emptying out their prisons. Um, the Ukrainians have their own problems. They've got some internal, a little bit of internal infighting. Right. Um, in part because of just this dissatisfaction right, of, over the lack of, of success during that counteroffensive. Right. They really were banking on that. Mm-hmm. And that had an impact when it didn't go out that way. It also had an impact here in the States where you started to get this, this, this idea that, wait a minute, what are we doing? Right. It took us 20 years to get fatigued from Afghanistan. It took us two years in Ukraine fighting Putin. Right. Through you know, you could argue, right? You could argue that it's, you know, Ukraine's a proxy, right? And we're, and you, you'll hear this from, you know, military personnel. They're saying, well, look, this is a, 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 this is a small cost to pay to degrade to the degree that we've done or that the Ukrainians have done the Russian military, right? And it's also shown 
a lot of weaknesses in the Russian military structure. Mm -hmm. And and so um, we can't, if we stop providing support to, um, to, uh, to the Ukraine, I'm not saying we continue with a certain level. I think we should be more strategic about the weaponry we're providing them. Um, Putin will go on the offensive. And it's just a matter of time before he would then have success, right? And he could well end up in Kiev. And that's what he's counting on. He's counting on the same thing that the Chinese count on with the U.S., which is we have a short attention span. We're going to get tired of it. And we're going to move on to something else. And that's what he's banking on. He has shown no interest, really, in serious negotiation, right? Um, and the only interest he would show is if the Ukrainians said, okay, you can have everything you've got right now. Right. He's not going to give up. Putin's not going to give up happily or willingly Crimea. So is that the weird part when you hear from our Congress people and senators when they're like, well, we just have to keep arming them. And it's like, well, that just doesn't get us to a resolution because unless you're going to take him out Mm -hmm. and make sure that the next guy doesn't launch some nukes, they're just not going to end this thing. Yeah. And that's the problem is that nobody's talked about the, uh, the roadmap for, you know, where's the exit ramp. Right. Right. And so, um, but, but the reality is Zelensky, you know, came out and said, we're going to take all our territory. We're not, you know, we're not going to the table until we get everything back. And again, Putin's not giving up Crimea. We didn't, nobody gave a shit about Crimea, right? And being taken over by the Russians right. years ago. It was not like people in the States weren't waving Ukrainian flags and, you know, well, I stand with Ukraine. It was yeah. a whole different thing. It was, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so it happened and we didn't care. But now we're like, what? Now we're supposed to like stand and say, you know, because it makes us feel good. Um, there's got to be a, there's got to be a solution here where they're both going to, not particularly be happy, which is the typical way that you end these things is both sides are a little bit displeased. But, you know, Putin's going to, you know, again, he's not going to give up willingly Crimea. Um, you know, can they get back more of their territory on the eastern side? You know, that'd be nice to think so. But, you know, they, there, there's got to be a resolution to this because we can't keep providing at the same level. And our NATO allies, they won't, right? They've got their own. It's, we're dickering in, in Congress about the aid package. They're doing the same thing in, in, mm-hmm. in the EU. So, um, and, and that's got Zelensky worried, but it's playing into Putin's expectations, right? That we were going to get tired of it. And they're doing their own disinformation campaign, right? To try to influence public opinion here, mm-hmm. right? About that. And yeah, and then which is to be expected. Anyway, so it's a, it's a, I guess the answer is, uh, I have no clue. It's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a fitting way to end, Mike. I have to say this was an absolute pleasure talking about wars all over the world instead of our political wars. So <laughs> I thank you for coming. Oh, uh, thank you, David. I yeah. appreciate it, man. Right I appreciate on. it. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop screaming, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.